Hi, and welcome to Real Bible. I'm Carol Salee, and this video is produced by the Salee Group. In each Real Bible segment, we'll strive to apply real truth from a real book to real life. Today, I'm introducing a three-part study of the book of Jude, and it's kind of surprising that a book with only 25 verses needs three segments. But as one commentary writer said, the book of Jude may be the most neglected book in the New Testament. I'm going to talk for a second, and this will kind of give you a clue as to what the book of Jude is about. In today's culture, as believers, we are confronted with modern plural pluralism and religious relativism. And to kind of explain that further, 72% in one study of Americans aged 18 to 25 believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. And the only non-negotiable truth is that everyone is right unless a person claims to be right. So it's okay to believe in Jesus if you believe he's just one of the ways, but not the only way. The belief that Jesus is the only way is the single most socially offensive aspect of Christian theology. Well, just sharing that little bit of a peek into our culture today should give you a bit of a heads up about what the book of Jude covers in his 25 verse book or letter. Now, I just want to give you a really big, broad overview of the scriptures and then show you where Jude is contained in the Bible. But I want you to picture that I have a chart in front of you. And on this side, it says the Old Testament. And the thing about the Old Testament is the Old Testament is so much about the law. And God gave the law to the Jewish people kind of with the disclaimer that if you want to be holy, like I'm holy, if you want to be in my presence in your holiness, here's all the things that you're going to have to be able to do to attain that. And since I know that you're not going to be able to do this, I'm going to put in a sacrificial system which will get you the forgiveness that you need to be able to be in my presence. So the law was like a giant object lesson, whole Old Testament, a giant ob object lesson in the fact that mankind needs a savior. But Christ is concealed in the Old Testament. The, the great heroes of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Samuel, they knew a savior was coming. They just didn't know who it would be. Then between the Old Testament and the New Testament is what's called the intertestamental period. And in the intertestamental period, it's 400 to 450 years of silence where no new prophecy is given. It's as if God has stopped speaking to his people. So the need for a savior was in the Old Testament. The hope for a savior that was coming grew very, very big in the intertestamental period, but Christ was still concealed. When we get into the New Testament, we come under grace and we find the arrival of the Savior and Christ is revealed. And if you know anything about the nativity story, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to a virgin and there's so many miraculous prophecies that were fulfilled in all of that. And so we come into the New Testament and the New Testament is organized in this manner. The first four books are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are the books of the Bible that introduce us to the Christ who has finally been revealed to mankind. We find out all kinds of things about Jesus. We get to watch him walk on this planet, perform his miracles, incredible teaching, amazing prayers. And then we step into the book of Acts. And Acts is like the gateway to the rest of the New Testament. It's the only history book in the New Testament. And it tells us about the birth of the early church. Between Acts and the very last book of the New Testament are a bunch of letters. And there's 13 letters from Paul that goes from Romans to Philemon. And then there's eight general letters. And except for Hebrews, the rest of the general letters are named after the person who wrote them. So what happened between Acts and Revelation that all these letters needed to be written? Well, that's one of the things that we need to understand because it will help us find out what is going on with Jude. Between the Gospels and Acts and Revelation, the early church was born. And when the early church was born, they began to take the Old Testament scriptures, which had already been canonized and, and made into a text of where God's people could be one book people and that, that we've come now into this New Testament period where the early Christians are having to figure out what do we believe and the apostles like 
Paul, they could see that the church was getting off track, and so they would write a letter to these new churches, like the Corinthian church, the Galatians church, the Ephesians church. They would write letters that started to teach the people how it was that they were supposed to go out living their Christian faith in the world and before God. Well, Jude is the very last of those general letters right before we go into the book of Revelation. So a little bit about the book of Jude. It was written in Greek. Jude is the last of those general letters. As I just said, it was considered to be a pastoral letter driven by the needs of his recipients. Now, scholars are unsure if Jude drew on Peter or if Peter drew on Jude or if they had a common source that no longer exists. What we do know about Jude is that it concludes strong messages of judgment against ungodly intruders who were attempting to corrupt the church and the Christian faith. Now Jude, in his 25 verses, uses quotes from books that are not in our 66 books of the Christian canonized Bible. So we have to stop here before we get into Jude and talk about this because we need some details about this to fully understand the book of Jude. And this is going to be a, just a crash course in the biblical canon. I hope that you will take some time to research this on your, on your own. But the biblical canon, the word canon comes from the word read or rod and came to signify a measuring stick. The term is used to describe the books that were divinely inspired by God and were guided by him to belong in the Bible. So canonization refers to when books gained the status of Holy Scripture and became an authoritative standard for Christian faith and practice. Well, the difficulty in determining the biblical canon is that the Bible did not come with a list of books that should be included in it. Determining the canon was a process conducted first by Jewish scholars and later by early Christians. And one of their primary directives was they determined that a book had to have the fingerprints of God on it to be included. But they would ask questions like these. Was it written by a prophet or by an apostle of God or an associate to an apostle, which the gospel writer Luke would be an example of that. Was it confirmed by acts of God? Does it have the power of God to edify, correct, and teach? And what that means in a, in a simpler version, it, it has a self-evidencing quality. That if someone didn't know anything about the Bible, picked up the Bible and read it, they would have enough to get started into their faith in Jesus Christ and how to live for Jesus Christ. And then the last question they would ask was, was it accepted and collected by the people of God? Now, interestingly, there were two books in the Old Testament that almost were not included. And one is the Song of Solomon. And I think kind of for obvious reasons, and if you don't know what I mean, you should go look at it. And the other one is the book of Esther. And part of that is because the book of Esther doesn't say the name of God. Now, she is living as a believer, and she is a Jewish woman who has come to be the queen in the area where the children of Israel were in captivity. So those two books almost didn't make that, and I'm so glad, particularly that Esther did. But the thing we have to remember is that the Bible wasn't all written down at the same time, copied and then distributed. There's over 40 people who were inspired by God to write it over a period of about 1,600 years. So we have to believe, as Christians, that ultimately it was God who decided which books would belong to the biblical canon. So when I pick up my copy of God's Word, the Holy Scripture, there's a lot of faith behind this. That this book came to us in the form and with the words that God had intended. Well, a couple of terms that we need to know as we study God's Word. The Apocrypha. Apocrypha means hidden or doubtful. Well, there's, old, there's an Old Testament Apocrypha and a New Testament Apocrypha. The Old Testament Apocrypha did not have either an explicit or implicit claim to be inspired by God. So like that book of Esther that I just mentioned, while it didn't have an ex explicit mention of God, it had an implicit mention of God by the way that she would pray, and by the way that she would fast, and some of the words that Mordecai said to Esther. Well, according to Judaism, the books of the Old Testament Apocrypha were written after the time when the spirit of prophecy had departed from Israel. I started with saying Old Testament, intertestamental period, New Testament. The books of the Old Testament Apocrypha were written in that 400 to 450 years of silence when it was believed that there was actually no new revelation from God. 
Now, another thing about the Old Testament apocryphal books was they were never stored in the temple. Neither Jesus nor any of the apostles cited texts from these books. And most of the church fathers of the first four centuries of the Christian church did not accept these books as inspired. Now, the New Testament Apocrypha, none have ever been accepted into any form of canonized scripture. And an example of that would be the book of Thomas. And if you look at your table of contents for your New Testament, you'll see that there's not a book of Thomas. There's a character of Thomas written about in the Gospels, but there's not a book by him. Well, another term besides apocryphal books that we need to know when we're studying the Bible is pseudepigrapha. And pseudepigrapha means writings falsely attributed. This is, during that intertestamental period, literature that was written but was not accepted into the Jewish or Christian canon. Now, the books that were written in there, they were attributed to ancient heroes of the faith but not actually written by them. An example would be that there is a pseudepigrapha type book that was, was attributed to Adam, that was attributed to Enoch, that was attributed to Moses, even though, because there's Moses, of course, wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But there, in addition to that, is a book that's called The Assumption of Moses. And that's not included in the 66 books of the canonized Bible. And then the last term you need to be familiar with is the Septuagint. The Septuagint is translations of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language so that those people who did not knew, know Hebrew could read the scriptures in a language they could understand. And at the time it was translated, Greek was like the world language that, that most people could speak at least a bit of that. Well, the name Septuagint came from the Latin word for 70. And church tradition is that 70 Jewish scholars were the translators behind the Septuagint in the third and second centuries BC in Alexandria, Egypt. Many of the New Testament quotes from the Hebrew Bible are taken from the Septuagint because the Septuagint had replaced the Hebrew Bible as the scriptures most people use. The fact that Jesus, the apostles, and New Testament authors felt comfortable under the direction of the Holy Spirit using the Septuagint should give us assurance today that a translation of the original language of the Bible is still the authoritative word of God. So we have the Old Testament canon and the New Testament canon. The Old Testament canon, the first five books, sometimes called the Torah or the Pentateuch, they were the first to be accepted as canon. The remaining Old Testament books were adopted not much more time before the birth of Christ. The Jewish people were wildly, wildly scattered at that time, and they really needed to know which books were the authoritative word of God because so many other writings claiming divine authority were kind of floating around out there. So with the fixing of the Old Testament canon, the Jews could become a people of one book, and it's that book that kept them together as a group of believers. New Testament canon. Following the time of Christ around 33 AD, the early church, Christian church found itself struggling for survival. And in the process, writing inspired documents that would later become the New Testament. So what's happened is we've got this church and they're trying to figure out using what we have from the Old Testament and knowing that Christ has now been revealed, how do we take all of that knowledge in scripture and what is going to be the truth of the Christian faith? And so they're struggling for survival. So Paul starts writing letters, Peter starts writing letters, John starts writing letters, and Jude wrote a letter. Well, after Christ, many writings and epistles were circulating among Christians and some were not authentic. So gradually there became a need to have a definite list of the inspired scriptures that would be considered the New Testament canon. Now one of the things that really shows us the providence of God, there are no originals of the New Testament, but there are 5,000 copies of New Testament texts, maybe even more since I, uh, since I looked that number up and I should have looked that up before I started today. There are other pieces of ancient literature that only have maybe a couple hundred copies of the original, and we don't see people questioning those. So the Bible, God has made sure that above and beyond what it would take to be able to believe that, that that's there. Well, some of the questions that were asked before a book got into the New Testament canon were questions like, was the author an apostle, or have a close connection with an apostle? As I said earlier, like Luke, does the book tell the truth about God? Does the body of Christ at large accept the book? 
And does the book contain consistency of doctrine and teaching? And the last one, does the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that reflect a work of the Holy Spirit? Because you see, truth cannot contradict itself. So agreement with the other books of Scripture was only logical, along with historical accuracy. Accuracy. If the facts of a book weren't accurate, it couldn't have been from God. God determined which books belonged in the Bible. It was simply a matter of him imparting to his followers what he and his sovereignty had already decided. So the point is that the formation of the canon did not come all at once like a thunderbolt, but was the product of centuries of reflection. And in this process, Christians recognize the providence of God in giving us his written revelation of himself and his purposes. First, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that phrase, carried along by the Holy Spirit, it has this image of a, a ship with sails that it's waiting in the water and what it needs to move is for the wind to come and blow through the sails. And so the metaphor is this picture of a writer like Jude setting down to write and waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and to give him the inspiration that he needs. So we need to understand that the, the writers, it's like they raised their sails and the Holy Spirit filled them and carried their craft along in the direction he desired to communicate his truth. The scriptures came about through the sovereign work of God. God chose to reveal divine truth through the scriptures, his word given through people to people. The biblical writers did not invent or make up their material. They spoke their own words using their own vocabulary, but the words they used were the words God wanted them to use. And here is a quote that is kind of a promo for why we study books like Jude. And this is from the New International Version commentary on the book of Jude. We must be careful to value all the biblical books. Christians are always tempted to construct a canon within a canon, a set of books within the Bible that are more important than others. The danger is that we will end up with an imbalanced Christianity, a view of faith based on a narrow selection of books and passages. The antidote is to study all of God's truth, not just those books we happen to be interested in. Which brings us to the book of Jude. And we only have time today to look at the four, first four verses. So I'm going to format this by asking a question that will give us some context to Jude and then reading a verse that will help us answer the question. Here's the first question. Who is the author of Jude? Well, Jude 1 says Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So Jude is the English translation of the Hebrew name Judah. It's kind of like Josh is short for Joshua, Jude is short for Judah. It also used to be short for Judas, but that name fell out of favor after his betrayal of Jesus Christ. Jude does not indicate that he is an apostle. But he does refer to the apostles of Jesus in verse 17. Well, church tradition strongly suggests Jude is a half-brother of Jesus and thus a leader in the early church. So Jude says, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. When he says a servant of Jesus Christ, Jude uses a word for servant that is doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. That word means bondservant. And a bondservant was a very special kind of servant. A bondservant was one who could have had his or her freedom, but instead said, no, I'm going to stay and serve you for the rest of my life. I will make that sacrifice. Well, that's actually what a Christian has agreed to do. A Christian has come to Jesus and said, I'm going to give you my life for my entire life. I'm going to serve you. So Jude is relating to those who have made that same commitment. But here's another thing that Jude is doing. Moses, when he would write in the Old Testament, would say Moses, a servant of God. So when Jude says Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, he is equating Jesus at the same level of God. And part of the Christian faith is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That would have been difficult for those who were still following the Jewish faith for them to see that equation of Jesus to God. Well, he also says a brother of James. There are several men called Jude in the New Testament, but the only one who was James' brother was also the brother of Jesus. And we're not really sure why he didn't say Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and also his brother. 
For some reason, he leaves that out. He doesn't pull the authority that would come with that. But we know that Jude was the son of Mary and Joseph, and like all of Jesus' brothers, did not believe in Jesus until after Jesus' resurrection. So the James that Jude is referring to is the James that wrote the book of James and who played a significant role in the early church. A question we do have to ask, and this isn't answered in Jude, is when was Jude written? Well, 2 Peter and Jude have a lot in common. And because of the dating of 2 Peter, Jude is placed in the same general time frame in about the late 60s, 60s AD. So Jesus died when he was 33, so about 30 years later, Jude is writing his book. So we've had 30 years now where Jesus has, has not been physically present. The Holy Spirit is here, and we have the Old Testament written, but we don't have the New Testament written, written yet. It's coming into being. And so, of course, there's going to be some discuss discussions about how should Christians live? What is it that Christians believe? Well, what is the background for the book of Jude? Jude wrote his letter at a time when the early church was struggling with threats from without, persecution that was coming from the Jews, persecution from pagans, persecution from the Greeks, from the Romans, but they also were struggling with threats from within, and it had to do with false teaching. You see, except for John, all the apostles had been martyred, and Christianity was becoming increasingly vulnerable to false teaching. So Jude called the church to fight for the truth. We'll get into that. Who's the audience for Jude? It's a, the actual identity of the recipients is unknown. This letter contains no specific information that permits identification of the first audience. Like when Paul would write to the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus, he would say that's who he was writing to. We do know that they were Christians that Jude knew well, because he calls them dear friends. And they were Christians that he wanted to warn. Now, one of the reasons we went into that whole biblical canon is that Jude does make, of course, references to Old Testament people and places and events, and that suggests that he was writing to Christian Jews because he doesn't take the time. He just mentions some biblical stories from the Old Testament, whereas if you were teaching someone who had never heard of that, you would have to stop and explain to them what story it is that you're referring to to the Old Testament. He doesn't have to do this with his audience. But Jude also uses some Jewish apocalyptic, uh, <laughs> I don't remember if I'm saying that right, the, the apocryphal books, I put it in my notes wrong, Jude is using the Jewish apocalyptic, I can't believe I've gotten myself so messed up on that, uh, apocryphal, apocryphal, apocryphal. He's using books from the apocryphal tradition. You can see why those two words are easy to get mixed up. But remember, the apocryphal books are the ones that were showing, that were written during the intertestamental period. And sorry for that brain glitch. An example of that would be that Jude quotes from First Enoch, and there seems to be some references to the Assumption or Testament of Moses. Well, his audience is assumed to have been familiar, and both of those references were considered to be part of biblical tradition. So here's one of the things that we have to remember. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to still have a good word for believers. Over here to my right is a whole bookshelf. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six bookshelves filled with Christian books. And some of these are written by long ago authors. Some of these are written in the last couple of years. That's not inspired Holy Scripture. Those books are not going to get into the canon of Scripture. But they still have a good word for me as a believer, and I trust those books whenever I go and I look at the author and I look at their statement of faith or I know the publishing house. And so that's not so uncommon. Like we look at Jude doing that and we think, oh, how can that be okay? Well, we do it all the time. I will quote, I just quoted from the NIV commentary, and there are some biblical great theologians, and you'll hear people quote from them. So it's a common way of getting a point across. So the audience, this is all we know about them in Jude 1, to those who were called, beloved, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. They are called, beloved, and they are kept. It's almost like a past, present, future is who Jude is imagining. When he says they're called, he's looking to the past. This is those who have accepted God's invitation to become disciples of Jesus. He says, beloved in God the Father. That's a looking to the present. That is those who enjoy the experience of God's constant divine love, protection, and goodwill. It's on a daily basis. But also to the future, kept for Jesus Christ. 
God exercises his power on our behalf to preserve us spiritually until the coming of Jesus. We have much to go through in this life, but God watches over us at every moment, keeping us safe for Christ's sake. This is God's grace of preservation. He is faithful in maintaining us in our faith until Christ returns. So there's the audience. And then in Jude 2, Jude moves to what is a typical greeting for this time in this culture. He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. He wants his readers to have in increasing measure on a daily basis the benefits of God's mercy, God's love, and God's peace. God's mercy, that is God's unmerited favor bestowed on sinners for their salvation. God's peace, that is the inner contentment that comes from that restored relationship with God. And then God's love, God's sacrificial love toward us and that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for the payment of our sins. So why did Jude write the letter? Well, he tells us what he really wanted to write and then he tells us what he has to write. He says in Jude 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So he wanted to write to them and talk about our shared salvation. Isn't it a blessing to have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ? But he changed his mind because somehow he learned about false teachers who had infiltrated the church and he's very concerned for them. When it says, I'm writing to you about contending for the faith, contend is a word that means to struggle for, to exercise great effort and exertion for something. The word carries the kind of intensity seen in athletes, and it describes their continuous struggles and efforts to win the prize. We watch a lot of football in this house. Well, I should say Phil watches a lot of football in this house. But occasionally I will look up from whatever I'm doing and I will see a football player who is carrying the ball and there are four guys attached to him trying to drag him down, but he is just working and working and stretching himself out to get the first down. Yes, I actually know what a first down is. That's the picture that we have the faith and we have to fight and it's going to be a battle. And that convicts me a little bit because I'm not sure what I'm contending is there a, a contending nature about the faith that I'm trying to live out for Jesus Christ? And when he says contend for the faith, what he means by that is a body of truth that came to be recognized as the essentials of Christianity. It's the body of Christian teaching or doctrine, what Christians believe. And he tells them where they got it from. He says that was delivered to the saints. And the word saints means all believers. I don't know how saintly you feel, but it means all believers once for all. So he's telling them, contend for what was given to them. Maintain the truth of the Christian faith as it had been handed down from Christ and the apostles. It started with Christ and with the apostles and it has continued to come thousands of years later and it maintains its integrity of truthfulness. And there are Christians today who are living according to the truth of the scriptures. So it has to do with being fully grounded in God's truth and that that is our protection against false teaching when we know God's Word, when we understand the books of the Bible that He brought to us and how they have everything we need for life and for godliness. And then he really explains what's going on in Jude 4. He says this, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. And he describes them, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice that he talks about our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's family language. That's that common salvation that Jude was so prepared to write about and now is not able to. But Jude preferred, instead of writing that encouraging letter, he wrote this urgent warning about some people in the church. He said they've crept in unnoticed by stealth. He's saying they're hiding their real nature and their real purpose. And he's saying they were designated for condemnation long ago. God has always dealt harshly with this type of behavior in the past, and he will continue to do so. First sin in the Garden of Eden had to do with people taking the truth of God's word and manipulating it. Satan shows up and says, did God really say? And then Eve, she says, well, he said, if we touch the tree, that we would die. God didn't actually say that. He said, if you eat from the tree, so she's taking it, just kind of a click off, and then before you know it, it's time for someone to write a letter to get things back to where it should be. 
if you'll notice early in the early church, Ananias and Sapphira, the people were selling plots of land and then they were giving them to the church. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they did that, but they didn't give all the money and they weren't expected to give all the money, but they said they gave all the money. Ananias comes first, he lies, and boom, God strikes him dead. They kind of take him out. That he's going to go to his burial, and Sapphira, his wife, comes in. She makes the same lie, and boom, she falls down dead. It's as if God is saying, I know we're on the grace side of things, but I'm not going to have this. I'm not going to have this in my early church. So God is always punished for those who have crept in and have distorted his truth, and he will continue to do so. He calls them ungodly. Jude calls them ungodly. So I looked up what that means. Ungodly is to act in a way that is contrary to the nature of God, to actively oppose God in disobedience, or to have an irreverent disregard for God. Jude was writing against godless teachers who were saying that Christians could do as they please without fear of God's punishment. While few teach this heresy openly in the church today, Many of us, and I'm saying us, including me, act as though sometimes we think this is true. Because what they've done is they've perverted the grace of God into sensuality and made it a license for immor immorality. It refers to a belief that God's grace entitles believers to do whatever we want. Whatever we want. That we can live sinful lives that are contrary to Jesus' teaching. We can fail to worship God with our lives, and that's not going to matter because we have God's grace. That is never what God intended, and Jude is calling them out for that. He also says they deny Jesus Christ as our Master and Lord. They're denying that Jesus is who he says he is. And when he uses that language, our only Master and Lord, again, he's equating Jesus Words that were typically applied to God now being applied to Christ. Here's a quote from my Life Application Bible. Even today, some Christians minimize the sinfulness of sin, believing that how they live has little to do with their faith. But what a person truly believes will show up in how he or she acts. Those who truly have faith will show it by their deep respect for God and their sincere desire to live according to the principles in His Word. It's a pretty weighty quote, and I want to remind you, that's something. I pulled a book off the shelf and studied it and included it. It's not canonized Holy Scripture, but it still was written by someone who has studied, applied themselves to Scripture, and it's something that we can still bring a truth out of. So the last question, what can we expect from Jude's letter? Knowledge is important in the Christian life. Jude emphasizes the important relationship between correct doctrine and true faith. Genuine servants of God will portray Christ in their words and in their conduct and will display godliness in the face of rampant ungodliness. So in closing, what application can already be made from Jude verse 1 through 4? Here's a couple of things. True believers have a duty to defend the true faith against false teachers. And true believers need to learn to recognize false teaching and the dangers of false teaching. Otherwise, we are susceptible to false teaching because we are not fully grounded in God's truth. We must understand the base, basic doctrines of our faith so we can recognize false doctrines and prevent wrong teaching from undermining our faith and hurting others. And I always thought this as I was raising my three children. It is much easier to keep untruth out than it is to repair its damage once it is within. And Jude is trying to get us to defend the faith to keep the untruth out because repairing the damage is so much more difficult. So in our next segment, we're going to look at Jude 5 through 16. I want to challenge you to read Jude 5 through 16 several times in several different translations and, and find out where we are headed. I can tell you this, I went through it. Whenever I am studying a book of the Bible, I usually print out the chapter that I am in and then I go through, I don't have a rhyme or rhythm to my notes or to the colors, but I'm just looking for some consistent wording or I'm looking for some Old Testament, Old Testament references. And one of the things I found in Jude 5 through 16 are 16 qualities of a false teacher. So we're just going to zoom through those. I don't mean zoom as, as we know zoom. We're going to go quickly through those in the next segment. Because Jude 
presents the judgment that will come upon false teachers. There are a lot of Old Testament references that will kind of I'll kind of give you some tips on how you can begin to look up Old Testament references. There's also a reference to the apocryphal book the, of First Enoch, and we'll talk about how we should learn to handle those. And then after Jude presents the judgment that will come to false teachers, that's where he describes the false teachers, indicating some common characteristics that they share. So much packed into just 25 verses. I hope you'll come back for the next segment. Thanks for watching.